Hello, my name is Melanie and I'm joined here today by the artist Maureen Bennett, whose multimedia pieces are on display at the Alpha Art Gallery for the Women's Caucus of Arts new exhibition, The Space In Between. Thank you for being here and how are you? I'm great, thank you. Awesome, all right, so first off, can you just talk a little bit about how you became an artist and how you developed your very distinct style? Well, thank you for saying it's distinct. <laughs> um, I, I went to college for fine arts, but I also got a degree in art history and landed myself in New York City working as an art director. And I was in an agency for many years doing that. Interestingly enough, the collision of the economic downturn in 2008 to 2010 resulted in my loss of work. And so what, what, what the result of being in this commercial world and using technology and solving problems creatively, I, the gears had to switch dramatically when I when clients went bankrupt and lost all their fortunes and I was out of work. And um, the consequence of that was a really happy one in that I decided to turn internal and say, okay, um, if you were to express something yourself and not solve a problem for a client, what would that be? And it, it made me retrace my steps to when I was a younger person and quite young and then also in school. And as a consequence of that, I've been very experimental this past decade, I'd say it's been about a decade, of on and off with this, not at all full time. Because in the midst of all this, I'm a social justice advocate and I've been working in the South Bronx for 30 years. So I've been doing this pro bono work in writing grants and um, I started a piece Peace movement for art after 9-11. So all of those confluences in kind of influence me. Uh, so there's a deep core of social justice in what I do. And then uh, I was able to just transfer that to just creating. Right. And it, it would move between abstract and representational. It would move between mediums, whether it was graphite, pastel, acrylic, oil, primarily visual arts. Not, uh, it wasn't as much... Um, into multimedia and certainly not into sculpture. But what that led me to is the challenges that um, come without any end in sight and no certain assignment. Um, it, it, it was a real, a real eye opener and a sense of awareness of what I could say and what was my voice. And for many years I struggled with that because it was not so clear. There was clarity and then it would dissipate and another thing would come. Throughout all of that, I'm an advocate for the arts, and that was always strong and consistent. And um, so that's where that's so recently, I've been an artist in residence in several places: the South Bronx, in um, a very private prep school, and also in a parochial school. So I kind of moved between a lot of communities of have and have nots, and they really were really things that it made the others better for it. So I'm really so grateful for being um, an artist and resident and teacher. And now I mentor students in my backyard okay. that um, whether they're going to college for their portfolios or they're going to high school. And mostly it's about getting in touch, empowering yourself. It's the voice that we all have and we just want to expose it. So that's where my heart lies. That's great. It's so interesting we were talking about kind of the financial crisis and how you started to turn to art. It's sound a little bit ahead of the game because I know so many people that I know that were kind of artists on the back burner or and now all of a sudden with the pandemic they were able to really like put that to the forefront but it sounds like you kind of started doing that a little bit. I, I did it I did it about a decade ago um but I I was um now it's even more intense. Sure. Now it's it's up uh, you know maybe all burners are on. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I was gonna that's that's interesting how that shifted. You know. So, and so, you know, I didn't always know if I had a distinctive style because it was more exploratory. Mm -hmm. I think if anything, what I tend to do is I let a process drive me after I've intellectualized it initially. And then I try to go to in, an intuitive place okay. and allow it to um, take me down a path that I would have otherwise not been there if I didn't process the day before something that led me down gotcha. there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a really intuitive kind of, you know, instinctual is probably a way. And then I can get tripped up intellectually because I can throw in meaning when it doesn't need to be there. Gotcha. But um, that's, you know, a little so bit of my history. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. 
So how how has that kind of process that you're describing like how did how did that kind of fit into your mandala? Like how did what what yeah. kind of event stirred you or what inspired you and then into that intuitive process? So for the most part, I would say I've always been a naturalist. Even when I was living in Chelsea, and Manhattan in my loft, I would have branches and, and rocks and things, you know, because I was always inspired by nature. That was a given. So I used to work on wood, painting, portraits. I, um, you know, was able to sort of shift my gear into like the understory of the woods. Like I would go to the, the bottom layer of the woods okay. and that brought out, you know, so I went and ran and got my camera. And I was never a photographer, but I, I, I am pro professionally trained to be an art director, so I know how to work camera. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that, so that started my mandalas about three years ago. And then I just did them on white and I made everything be about in situ. I would never style it. I would find it and it would be that, that I found. Mm -hmm. And um, then when, it, when the pandemic happened, I remembered that experience that I had two to three years prior and I started taking all my artwork out pastels big paintings sure. and then I would make little paintings and every morning I'd wake up and make a painting and then I would walk it out into the woods and whatever I found I would climb up on a tree or underneath it and I just started all these years of me saving all this disparate artwork when there might be one thing that brings it together in a new way mm -hmm. and um an alchemy so to speak you know so uh so that's really what happened i took my art with nature in a few seconds i would never spend a lot of time whenever the light came i shot it i just spilled on my painting and made it drip i let it drip mm -hmm. and um so there was a a sense of um, like uh, just winging it, kind of like just allowing it to be a carpe diem moment. Like that's light at seven o'clock in the morning. That did it. I'm done. And I, I would be finished photographing in about 15 minutes. And then the hard work began after that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I was influenced by whatever was going on in um, the news. So if Black Lives Mattered, um, I found something that was yellow and black. I, I made ink drawings, big paintings in black, took mm -hmm. them out into the woods and, and and into my vegetable garden. I started working in my garden. Oh, wow. And I would make a piece of art, bring it out. The next day I would do more work on the art and the plant would have grown. So this whole process between the tangential relationship of my creation with nature right. started evolving between the two uh, transforming. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing just became a, a an intense an intensity that I couldn't stop almost. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do is come inside and for the better part of the day try to make sense out of these images. And I started fusing them together in Photoshop and InDesign and my programs that I know. Um, and uh, I built mandalas. The idea of the centering focused Hmm. kind of felt important to me that they could mean something for me and for others. I feel the mandalas are meant to be shared and historically and culturally and metaphysically and everything, they, they serve a role in, in man's, you know, interaction with either whether it's nature or religion or other people, mandalas exist in so many cultures. Hmm. So um, I had been teaching it to so many of my students about it and then I took it on myself. And um, so the idea of maybe symmetry with something a little bit off, but a centered sense shifted me from a micro look at it to a macro. And I kept going between the view of the world and what I'm feeling inside. Mm -hmm. And then every day I would make one, I would send it off to somebody that was struggling. You know, my son's friend was doing chemo, a young guy from DC, and I would send him things just as he's processing, what are you doing? The reaction I got from so many people was, <clears throat> yeah, of great, love, yeah. love and healing and, and, and just um, joy, mm -hmm. joy. And I, I made a mandate to myself. It was a declaration before I began that I was going to create joy wow. and not struggle. Mm 
mm. not struggle. If anything resembled a struggle, abandon it and go to another path. It didn't. It didn't mean that struggle couldn't be part of the joy. Sure. But it couldn't be sh- just in and of itself suffering. You no. Know? Right. You know? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and um, so the final step for a lot of my mandalas now are many live virtually. Mm-hmm. I made a goal to create one per day of, of, of the mandala. I'm, I'm sorry, one per day of the pandemic. And it didn't mean that I had to create one a day. It meant that one represented the day because there were days when I was extraordinarily prolific and other days that I wasn't. So, um, you know, when life takes its course. And um, the final stage is I've been printing them out quite large, Mm-hmm. Some smaller, and I've been hand painting them in metallics, pastels, colored pencils, and everything. So now that they're taking on the hand touch again, started with the hand, the human touch, went to technology, came out of technology, went back to the human touch. Wow. So that's kind of I don't know. I'm making this stuff up. I'm just just I'm just allowing it. And I think I think the pandemic served me in my my persona like the way that i see things i have too many things i'm interested in i have so many things that i want to do that it kind of narrowed me down and stay and, and it's put me in a spot that i couldn't do anything but really look at myself and not get distracted by anything else but me with me and so that was very helpful and also when i sent it out virtually to people i was connected to a greater good and that served me too. So it, it was nourishing me in the in the way that um, if I could let another person experience something in it that is their own and not what I created, but what they want to create because of it. Mm-hmm. I wanted an emotional reaction. I wanted emotion. I didn't want to just have beauty. I mean, I, beauty can serve as an emotion. Sure. It's very important, but I there's a transformative quality to you being able to find something that's just for you Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. whether it's because what are you dealing with in the pandemic you know Mm -hmm. what are you personally evolving i'm so tuned into other people that way in a a universal way that it it um made me feel not so isolated and connected yeah wow thank you for sharing that's such a beautiful story of kind of your whole creative process again you kind of you're doing that okay. micro macro kind of shift where it's like how it's affecting you, how it's kind of involved in the greater scheme of things. And also I really like how you talked about how you're sending it to other people and bringing them joy. And that's, well, I was also, I'm sure it's a very symbiotic relationship. You kind of, like you said, you get joy out of it too. In the it's so t- totally true. You know, you can post things and I, I'm not an over poster at all. I just have Instagram and I have some of them there, mm-hmm. but I was very strategic about that too. I didn't say, you know, every time I make something, I'm putting it, I said, no, Mm -hmm. this is about, you know, you know, whenever I feel it, I will do it. It's not going to be so rigid and I'm going to allow, it's a real look at nature. It's a kind of really a, a grounding in nature. It's like when everything else is swirling around you, if that tree that you just looked at yesterday just had another branch fall off of it, but you see a new bud, Mm. like a new, hope it's it's existing the entire universe in that one little thing that you just saw almost Mm -hmm. you know so i was very much having a relationship with uh, observing a simple shrub or a branch as i was trying to figure out what my role is in this election and the world you know (laughs) yeah Hmm. so it's it's so layered in that way kind of superimposed on each other and and my work became more layered and I used to think is the layering of my work a result of me overthinking all of these things and how they interconnect or is it sometimes we are layered and sometimes we're not mm-hmm. and so the, the beauty of a mandala was it could offer me an opportunity to have a complex image mm-hmm. and That's it serves its purpose and sometimes when it was just simple and it, it served a, a real you know a breath of fresh air and a reset button for me because mm-hmm. I have to coach myself many times right. to not make things cl- like busy <laughs> and 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 complicated I have to strip it down and um, working in fast with an urgency and intuitively allows the stripping down to sort of always be there in a, some form mm-hmm. and if I stop that 
I have to write myself a note and put it while I'm creating to remind me not to overthink that. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Great. And then I'm also curious, I, you, you were kind of touched on it a bit, but you also talked about, you know, trying to elicit joy, but you also touched on centeredness or centeredness. Sorry. That's my, that's my New Jersey accent coming through to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you, you kind of balance even in asymmetry. So I was wondering why is that something that's important to you important, and something that you think is important to kind of convey to the people that you're, you know, sending mandala to use or- Symmetry or asymmetry? Asymmetry or like kind of symmetry. You said symmetry oh. a little off. You know what? It's, it's an interesting thing because I don't think I'm a tremendously symmetrical person hmm. and yet I do respond to symmetry mm -hmm. but it so if you had a spiral and you looked at a shell or anything you might have this sense of repeated pattern making but it's evolving and growing and so that kind of resonates with me so that, that which is very much math and it's very much you know science you know we we see it in its form right in front of us but as an artist I could never make nature the way na nature makes nature, and I don't want to. Sure. I, I would I would have to put every brush down and every pencil down and every camera down if I really felt that I was um, that that was my my calling to try to compete with nature. It isn't. It is to honor nature, and so um, and and to give it your own voice, perhaps you know, to try to create a relationship between. Um, that which you see and what it means to be human. Like, why am I here? You know, all those universal questions that we ask ourselves. And I, and I think creativity does a, a real service in us addressing it um, in, in so many different ways that elicit responses that go beyond just cerebral functioning. It's just on a another level. And, um, so asymmetry was my way of being human, maybe, <laughs> and, and or allowing, because I could never be strong enough to hold everything in perfection equally. It just that isn't my goal. So, and when you get involved in technology, you can easily get caught in flipping an image and making it perfectly symmetrical, and then you think you're done. And so sometimes that does work, and sometimes it doesn't for me. I, I shift things slightly, and, and it all goes back to being sort of in touch with your um, maybe your intuition your gut and then just walking away and coming back and the feature of hand coloring and hand painting allows me to have the um, relationship with technology that I want to switch on and off with sure I don't want to always have technology be my um, tool yeah you know sure it's just a, it's just one of the tools in my toolbox but it's not you know, the only thing yeah, that, that, I was also wondering, do you think, since, you know, you kind of do focus on nature, um, and you, you talked about kind of your multimedia, how you kind of layer everything on top of all those layers, like, do you think when you go out into nature, was that something that you just thought was inherent? Did you, when you started kind of photographing or being in nature and kind of getting inspired from mandalas, did you think, oh, this has to be multimedia, or cause just by because of how you saw nature, or was it something that you kind of try to manufacture a little bit more. Does that make sense? I think that's a product of our era. Yeah. You know, with so much, it, so much immediacy and quickness to it, the response is right there. You get your image, you're not, you know, when I've done drawings where I've, I've done giant graphite drawings, and that could be two months on a drawing, a little bit of that part of me when I found that first thing in that broken branch that I said, oh, maybe I'll draw this, let me just take a picture. And maybe I won't bring the branch into my studio today. I'll just, you know, work off of that. And that led itself only that conversation. So the intention wasn't to go get it and reproduce it. The intention was just to study it from another form, you know, whether it's me looking at it or me looking at it through a camera. Um, so to, to answer your question of whether I think I've come a long way from that first time of having that interaction, so maybe I do see it through the camera lens, but I try not to. I try to see it as if I was to, what is my goal here? What is my, to elicit what? To elicit joy? Um, I can probably get it by drawing that tree. 
and I can probably get it from photographing the tree. I'll get joy from both of those things. Hmm. But to produce it in, in, a, in a new way, with a new pair of eyes, and, and to respond, I'd see something, I stop. Okay. And, I, and if I make a mistake, not a mistake, if I press a key that's not the key I wanted and something happens to the image, I hold everything hmm. and I respond. So I'm allowing the same intuitive thing that happened in the woods with what I see falling down from the tree as what happens on the computer. If I see something that's happening, I don't try to control it. I try to, okay, what, what button did I just press? I don't even know what button I just pressed. You know, and then I allow that to sort of like, you know, I undo it. I try to go back and retrace my steps and, sure. but I've had a lot of happy stances with that. I, I don't often hear that a lot, like people, especially, I, I think it's really interesting that you caught yourself with mistakes and saying, like, no, it's actually, it's not a mistake. It's not an error, you know, it has a different connotation. So that's really, that's really neat. Yeah, and I, and I remember that same feeling when I would drop a piece of work by accident on the floor, mm. something would fall off and I would see it from that four foot diff distance now in a different way and the way it fell and I would be like oh do not touch that yet oh wait a minute I think I might have something new here and I would actually change something because of that piece falling on the floor so is that is that a less or not lesson but is that kind of mindset or is that something you developed recently or is that something you've just always been working on I think I've always, I, I probably have had a thread of that throughout me mm -hmm. but um I'm not sure if I recognized it. Sure. Mm -hmm. No. But the interesting thing is for about 30 years, I have been giving creativity workshops in the South Bronx. And um, it's people that live below the poverty line. And what's so fascinating about it is um, when they come into the room, they don't have a lot of time. It's essential living. It's like bare bones, sustainable living, like on what anybody gives them, you know, right? If there's a free cup of coffee or a meal. and. As a consequence of that, I allowed myself to really work with immediacy all the time with them. Mm -hmm. You're only here until your baby cries in that stroller or the, the people on the, in the floor above you watching your child so you can take an art workshop. Mm -hmm. And as a result of watching them work all those years and, and responding to whatever I put in front of them, I never, ever, ever doubted the power of expression in every single person that came in that room something was going to transform them and something was going to happen and it always did whether it made them cry made them joyful made them there was there was just a trust in the process of put materials ask somebody to open their heart up just go to work wow. so i kind of kind of use that method in teaching also so maybe i had to turn the lesson on me <laughs> so yeah. That's such a, that's such a, that must have been such a great experience and so yeah, much, yeah, that's, that's yeah. And I just wrote another grant last week mm -hmm. in a community here where I know children have digital divides and I'm really concerned about that. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, the kid that's online learning and maybe he has three other siblings in the same house and they have only one computer, you right. know, so, um, I'll find out if I received it, but, uh, but the idea is that that same creative, like trust in reaching people to reach themselves it's really an empowerment lesson mm -hmm. you know and uh yeah that's great and i guess also so that those are different lessons you i guess you've kind of learned over the years is there anything i've kind of been asking i've interviewed a couple of the artists for the gallery are is there like a specific lesson that you've learned through the pandemic um, like have you about you your process art mm -hmm. or maybe even appreciation of nature like I know we touched on it a bit about how you maybe you're more exposed to it but what's if, if you had a huge kind of general takeaway from the pandemic and art like what what have you kind of elicited I, I would say it's a very personal lesson that um, I wouldn't stay put and I would I would do something I would complete it but I wouldn't go deeper I and mean, I wouldn't last longer and I, I would allow the interruptions or the changes in my life that I thought was all wonderful parts of my life to sidetrack me all the time. I feel much more disciplined and quieter and, and power, more powerful because I have made it be a constancy that I had not had. Um, I was not an artist that had that real 
complete discipline of every day of the week, I'm in my studio for eight hours. Gotcha. No, I, I would be, you know, filling it with other things that were equally wonderful, but I shouldn't say equally wonderful. They were just wonderful, but they were not um, the same challenge of me addressing a deeper look at myself. And as a result, I've had to write about it and think about what I really, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write a lot more. And I have always written, but um, I really think there's a lot of power in words. Sure. So I just finished a piece with John Lewis's um, essay that he asked to be published in the Washington Post on the day of his funeral. Right. And I took every single word and wrote it into my piece. And it allowed me to really kind of start addressing the power of words for me. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been challenging. Like when I go to say, well, like, what am I going to write? I, I have the same, you know, interest in a lot of things. And, and so it's, it goes into too many directions. And I want to stay a little bit more focused. And, and it's taught me that. And I think there's an urgency. And perhaps maybe because I'm older than I was when I, you know, first started out doing art, there's a sense of urgency in me due to that and due to the uncertainty. It makes me feel like the day has hope in it. Mm. A tremendous light comes from doing it. And then I've um, sent it to so many people that it's either up on their walls or it's I've gotten into so many shows lately. Yeah, I, I think it's a, there's a sense of, of deep intention to care for others. So it's my intention to create and then to share. And I put those two together when I made a mandala. That wasn't always when I did all my other work. This had a very strong component of sharing mm -hmm. to it. That's, those are such great, beautiful lessons. Like how we yeah. talked about it before, but kind of like taking those, you yeah. know, tough situations. And sure, there's probably a, a stance of privilege being able to take, you know, this is a learning opportunity versus anything, but at the same time, it's great to hear some positive, you know, not only your not only your work, but also your kind of perspective and and. Yeah, thoughts. no, I really feel that way. I, I I just I can, and and because I've gotten a response, it has allowed me to feel more powerful too. You know, there's been a a conversation there a little mm -hmm. bit more, and or or at least a, a a reward from having helped somebody or they have helped me. You know, it's a mutual thing and. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you no, know, I'm I'm very grateful for that, and um, and I also don't want to just create art and put it in my drawers and shut the door. Mm -hmm. This video, you know, I don't I don't want that. You know, I don't want to have a pile of stuff that you know just sits there. So, I'm, I'm conscious of that. That became something I'm much more conscious of in the past few years people who are watching for more information regarding uh, this exhibit and Maureen's work, um, please check out alphaart.org and also her website, which is maureenbennett.com, two N's and two T's. And you can also see a link to her social media there. But thank you so much.